Are you ready for the word today? Are you ready to hear some things that you probably have never heard before in God's word? I like that. I like the, the gold nuggets that in God's word that, that, are, that are dispensed to us from time to time, and we, we enjoy these things. This morning, I'd like to talk to you a sermon called Live Long and Prosper. Live Long and Prosper. And what is that reminiscent of? Spock. 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 Live Long and Prosper. And what he would say those of you that are friends or associates or you guys are fans, friends or associates, fans of Star Trek. How many fans of Star Trek do we have here today? Man, I was born and raised on Star Trek. My dad got me into that. I give my dad all the credit for getting me involved in science fiction. I love Star Trek. You know, and, and one of the things he would always watch is the old one, the golden oldie with Captain Kirk and Spock. And what was the greeting that Spock always had when he came to meet somebody or when he was saying goodbye, he'd always say, live long and prosper, right? Well, many of you know that Spock or Leonard Nimoy passed away last week. He went into eternity. One of the things that perhaps we did not know is the origin of this. Now, those of you on social media have probably had opportunity to, to click there on Facebook at one of his little snippets of his, of his story about where that came from. The director was wanting to have some kind of a Vulcan greeting with an alien greeting and stuff like that. And, and Spock just brought this out of his life, a, a sign that he had seen when he was a little boy. He was a little boy. His grandpa was Jewish, a very Orthodox Jew, and they would worship together at synagogue. And so one time when Leonard Nimoy went as a child to his grandfather's synagogue and worshiping the Kohen that was there, okay, the, the priest, as it were, the rabbi, gave the blessing of the people. And in, in Orthodox Jewish synagogues, you can't look at it. You can't look at the priest or the rabbi when he's giving that benediction, when he's giving that priestly blessing. Because they do it in different ways. They would have the hands like this. Sometimes they bless the people, and other times they'd put it like this, depending on which, which Kohen you were under. All right, I've got to get my fingers spread apart. And they believed that the divine presence, that the glory of God came through that little triangle right there. You know, they believe that the glory of God came through the, the, the presence. And so the Jewish people would not look at the divine presence at the very end of a service. They believed that when the, when the Kohen would give that blessing, the presence of God. So they would cover their eyes and the really devout Jewish people would turn their backs to the rabbi so that there would not even be a chance of them glimpsing that symbol, that, that hand sign of the rabbi. So a lot of them, that would, uh, they would have their prayer shawl or the tallit, and they'd put it over their heads, and they would bow their heads so they wouldn't look at that blessing. They wouldn't look at the rabbi. But little Leonard, Leonard Nimoy, his grandfather, extended the prayer shawl around his head, and as they were receiving the blessing of the Kohen, Leonard wanted to see what's going on. Grandpa, Grandpa said, don't look, don't look. You can't look. You can't see this. Of course, what does any little boy do? <laughs> yeah. He's looking up there, and that's what he saw. And so Leonard Nimoy took that symbol, he took that sign of blessing, and later on in life, when he became one of the main characters of Star Trek, he took that symbol with the director, and it was kind of off the cuff. And he created that, live long and prosper, which was a phrase of blessing, but was also the sign of, ble of the priestly blessing of the Kohen, of the priests. Isn't that fascinating? That's, a, that's pretty amazing. I remember when I was a little kid, I wanted to be like Spock, and I wanted to try to do that Vulcan greeting, and I was not coordinate, coordinated enough to do it. Some people can do it naturally, and other people cannot. I could not. So what I did, I grabbed rubber bands and wrapped them around my fingers as a kid <laughs> until I could finally train my muscles to be able to do that. You know, And don't tell me that somebody else in here hadn't tried the same exact trick, because I know some of you had to do the same thing. But today, we want to talk about live long and prosper. We had Spock up there, and now we see the, the, maybe the little picture you saw of the, of the Kohen giving the blessing of the people. Now, the high priest is called the Kohen Gadol. The Kohen Gadol. And he would give a blessing to the people with his hands a little bit lower than the priests. There's a whole bunch of priests, but the high priest had to be lower because he could not raise his hands. He could not have God... Uh, be disrespected by him having his earthly hands over his head. 
That's the way they looked at it. That's the way they processed these things. The other priests, the other Kohen, could lift their hands about face level, but the high priest had to be a little bit lower to show his earthly humility, to show that he was just a man. And so you saw that, that little picture that was up behind me of the, of the Kohen behind the high priest giving sacrifices. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Numbers, chapter 6. Numbers, chapter 6. There towards the front of your Bible, it's what we call one of the Pentateuch, or the Pentateuch, however you decide to phrase that. Numbers, chapter 6. Pentateuch, meaning the first five books, Pentas 5, which is known as the law. Okay, the law. So whenever the Bible says the law and the prophets, the first five books is the Pentateuch, which is referred to as the law, the law of God. Book of Numbers, chapter 6. Verse 22, if you're there, say amen. amen. It says in God's word, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Father God, I thank you for your passage of Scripture. God, this potent, very powerful blessing, God, that you commanded the priests to say upon the people at every gathering. God, many of us have heard this in maybe our Protestant circles, our Protestant fellowships, we've heard this before. But God, may we continue to understand it in the way that you understood it as a Jewish rabbi in your own right. God, I pray that as we break this bread of the word of God, may we eat of this spiritual bread and be filled today. May we be increased. God, I pray again, you take my stutter and my stammer to be able to speak clearly and concisely to your people this day. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said again, amen. amen. The priestly blessing. This passage of scripture, you need to highlight it in your Bible because God intended this blessing to be very integral in the life of his people. Very, very important, this blessing. In fact, the two small silver scrolls have been found in Israel dating back to the 7th century BC, which is the oldest example of any text of Scripture. The oldest archaeological writings of Scripture that we have is this verse. Is this verse. Even when we, when we condense it a little bit to the, Lord, the words, the Lord bless you and keep you, the phrase, the Lord bless you and keep you, has also been found inscribed in Hebrew on a large storage jar from the 9th century in the northern Sinai, which is about the time of Solomon. Solomon, the greatest king of Israel's history. It's a very, very powerful, powerful phrase in the expounded scripture. This is the part of the service that each week the, the, the Jewish people pray for the return of the temple to Jerusalem, in which they believe God's ultimate blessing can only be conveyed through temple worship. So every single week during the Sabbath prayers, during Shabbat, they pray this prayer of blessing or they recite it. Only a Kohen can recite it and give the blessing, but the Jewish people will recite it without receiving the blessing. That's the way they, they think of that. But they say this every time when they're praying, when they're crying out to God for the temple, for the temple to come back, for the temple to be rebuilt, they pray this prayer. Of blessing. Let's look first of all at the priestly role of these, of these individuals giving this blessing. Again, only the priests could give this blessing upon the people, and that's called again a Kohen. And sometimes you'll, you'll meet a Jewish person with the last name of Kohen, with either a C or a K. And that is a person that probably has come down through the Aaronic priestly line, okay, that has Jewish blood in them, that, that they are of the tribe of Levi, not only just a tribe of Levi, but they're also a priestly line. Now, a lot of the genealogical records have been lost. And so a lot of times people will change their name to be a Kohen. And sometimes they can then use that to try to manipulate people, especially of the Jewish faith. But, but if you run into a person with the last name of Kohen, that is your clue that they are perhaps of the priestly, ironic line of the tribe of Levi. Today, again, this passage is recited in many synagogues, but only the Kohen can say it as a blessing. 
because of this scripture right here, what God gave the mandate to the Jewish people, to, to Aaron, Aaron and his sons, to give that blessing. You guys remember John the Baptist? Remember John's dad, Zechariah? What was he? He was a Cohen. He was a Cohen. He was a Cohen who sacrificed in the temple. And remember, they, they took shifts. There were so many Cohen, there were so many priests that they took a shift every day, every week, and every priest would get the opportunity to sacrifice before God at least once inside the temple on the daily, the daily burning of the incense. I remember when Zechariah went into the temple on his one time to give a sacrifice before God of the incense, he saw the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel told him that he was going to have a son. And he had a little bit of an argument with Gabriel right there inside the temple. How many of you have ever argued with God in church? Yeah, right here. Well, Zechariah did the same thing. Remember because of Zechariah's doubt, because he was so old, that he doubted he could have a son? Gabriel said, because of your doubt, you will not speak again. Okay? And then when John was born, he had to write everything on clay tablets. And then when they were debating about John's name, what it was going to be, he wrote there on the tablet, he said, his name is John. His name will be John. And then at that moment, his tongue was loosed and he could speak again. Well, since the office of the Cohen was hereditary, John the Baptist would have also been a Cohen in the line of the house of Aaron of the tribe of Levi. Okay? He's also the cousin to Jesus. Luke chapter 1 verse 5 tells us a little bit about John's role here. John, his, both of his parents, both Zechariah and Elizabeth, were of the house of Aaron. So Jesus comes to John the Baptist to be baptized, and John is dismayed. Remember, the hereditary role of John the Baptist, John is a Cohen. John has the authority and the blood to be able to minister before God in the temple. And John says, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And Jesus has to talk him into it, right? Talk him into being baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness. John, as a Kohen, recognizes the spiritual authority above him. The only spiritual authority above a Kohen is the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. So John recognizes the high priest coming into the Jordan River waters with him as John feels unworthy to baptize in his summation the Lamb of God, the great high priest there in the Jordan River. John recognizes Jesus' higher status and he calls him in the book of John chapter 1 verse 29 the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God, the sacrifice. So John is equating both the high priest and the Lamb of God, the sacrifice that will take away the sin of the world. Has anybody's minds been blown yet this morning? That's pretty awesome stuff. Therefore, you have a Kohen, John the Baptist, acknowledging the higher supremacy of not only the Kohen Gadol, but the Messiah. The atonement of sin could only come from the Kohen Gadol. The Kohen Gadol, the high priest, is the only one allowed to go into the presence of the Ark of the Covenant, the most holy place, and sprinkle the blood of the atonement upon the bema, upon the, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Only the Kohen Gadol could enter into that one little room once a year to sprinkle that blood on the Day of Atonement. John recognizes this Lamb of God also as the great high priest for the final sacrifice to be offered. So we understand now that Jesus is the great high priest. The Bible continues to reaffirm that in our lives today. There has not been a Kohen Gadol since 70 AD when the temples were destroyed. So for 2,000 years, there's not been a high priest but as Christians, we know better because Jesus Christ in our lives is the great high priest. 
And John the Baptist, his cousin, a Kohen, also recognized that. Let's look now at the blessing. Again, God gives this directive to Moses and Aaron. Why? Because God desires to bless his people. God wants his people to live under blessing. And when we will look throughout the Old Testament, we see different types of covenants displayed. But this one is not a covenantal blessing. It's, it's covenantal in the fact that it goes to God's people, but there's nothing required of the people in order to receive this blessing. And this poem, God does all of the work. In this instance, nothing is required of the people. Only God is mentioned as doing anything. God is doing all the heavy lifting here. God wants to bless his people, and he didn't require anything of his people to receive it in this particular priestly blessing. It was to be a generalized blessing upon the Israelites. There's different blessings in this passage. There's about three of them. Let's look at the first blessing, and he says, The Lord bless you. And as I go through this passage of Scripture today, I'm going to give some rabbinical explanations because it does the most good, it has the most potency for us to understand it as Jesus understood this passage. A lot of us perhaps grew up in different churches and congregations that, that made this a part of their, their ritual every Sunday, and you've heard that growing up. You've heard this blessing. But let's take it now and understand it in the way and the mindset that the rabbis, Jesus being a rabbi, that he would have understood this passage. So when it says that the Lord bless you, the rabbis believed in most of the rabbinical commentaries that this first blessing refers to material prosperity. They state that this blessing entails that Israel, quote, be triumphant over its enemies and superior to other nations, that its crops and business ventures succeed, its offspring and flocks be abundant and healthy, so their possessions may increase as well as the days of their lives. The rabbis also acknowledge that material blessing is secondary to spiritual blessing. The rabbis were well aware of that. The greatest blessing to have is spiritual blessing. But in teaching this priestly blessing here, this first part when it says, the Lord bless you, they believe that to mean material blessing. Their explanation is that God blesses, us with, God blesses us with prosperity to enable people to devote themselves to biblical study. The rabbis understood that if we receive that blessing in our life, material blessing, prosperity, that we are to use that prosperity to put into biblical study. And so those of us that continue to, to understand and enjoy God's blessing, that prosperity was to be able to give us increase so that we can have the ability or more time to put into biblical studies. A lot of times we think that because of our material blessing that is poured into our life, we think that's just because of how awesome we are as a businessman. And we think that that means we need to put it more into doing things or spending money on this, that, or the other. But the rabbis understood that the Lord bless you. That increase was to be given for your ability to study God's word more. Next part of that, phrase is to keep you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The word there to shamar. The word shamar means to hedge about, to guard, and to protect. The Lord keep you. Protect it. Keep it from harm and from danger. So it's a request for protection, and it speaks of things that need to be protected after they have been granted. So God has just granted his people blessing materially, and now they're asking and requesting for that protection of that blessing, the protection to be guarded about, to be, to be hedged in by the Holy Spirit. The rabbis said that the spiritual blessings cannot be taken away. Spiritual blessings are the responsibility of the individual, but the material blessings given by God are always subject to outside danger. The things we have in this life can be taken away. There is outside danger there. So the, the, the Jews believed that they had asked for that blessing and then also to be hedged in about, to be protected. Why is it that Jewish people have the reputation of being some of the wealthiest people in the world? Why is it that Jewish people, people don't like them because they're known for being wealthy? Most of the people in the top 50 greatest uh, philanthropists, the people that give money to charity, I think about a third of them are Jewish. Tremendous amount of wealth and prosperity. Why was it that the Nazis hated the Jewish people? They were all businessmen and merchants. They were wealthy. 
the Nazis saw the wealth of their nation going to predominantly Jewish families, so they developed the Jewish problem, and they developed a systematic way to rob them and pillage them and kill them off because of their great blessing that was upon their life. This phraseology, this this verse of blessing being set upon you every single week, how can you not be blessed? And blessed they were. And people will hate you for your blessings. People will hate you for your prosperity, for your increase. Whatever you have as increase in your life, people will not like you getting those things. So God, the, the, the people of God asked again, as God constructed that there in that prayer of blessing, to be hedged about. The rabbinical explanation of this first blessing, the exact form of the blessing will depend on the need of the individual. The student will be, need to be blessed in his studies and the merchant his business. Therefore, also as material blessing, they counted material blessing as a student being increased in knowledge, in learning, in wisdom, having a sharp mind. They also believe that the God would may bless you with wealth and protect you so that you can use the money to give charity or to God's work. According to the Hebrew sages, the best way to preserve one's wealth is to use it for charity and good works, which assures God's continued blessing. I think most of us will probably agree and, and come in alignment with that, that belief. Remember when we talked about the zedaka a few weeks ago, the giving of the tithe, the Jewish understanding of the zedaka. That was a pretty fascinating a little study we did. If you haven't had a chance to, to see that, if you were not here that day, go back on the internet and go back to the archives of a few weeks ago and understand that message, Zadaka. Let's look at the second blessing in this passage. It says, make his face to shine upon you. The word there in the Hebrew is luminous, means luminous. May God's face shine or be luminous towards you. May it be bright, be it engaging. May God continue to be the light of your life. May you know God's illumination. May you know God's potency, his power. Continues on, and be gracious to you. May may he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The word there in the Hebrew is shanan, which means to bend or stoop in kindness to a lesser being. To bend or stoop in kindness to a lesser being. Now, as Americans, sometimes we don't really like that because we all believe we're equals. Our country and our principles are founded on being equals. So we think somebody's being kind of snooty and uppity up when we say about bending or stooping to a lesser being. But friends, that's who God is. Our God is a God. He is not your equal. Okay? He is a sovereign God. He is the King of kings. And in our Western mentality, we sometimes chafe at kingship because we were released from a king of England to inherit our freedoms and our liberties. Now, friends, as Christians, we have freedom in Christ. We need to understand Christ is a king. He is sovereign. He does whatever he wants to do, and he doesn't have to pass it through Congress. You don't like executive orders now, then you're definitely going to have problems in heaven. See? See? You see, we've got some problems with authority as Americans. We're the best in the world. We don't like taking second seat to anybody. We've got problems with authority. And that sometimes bleeds into our spiritual life too, doesn't it? We have problems with God's authority. We've got to understand and continue to realize that God is sovereign. He does what he wants to when he wants to, and he doesn't have to give you a reason He is a sovereign God. He is a sovereign God. May he be gracious to you. Graciousness. Gracious, a supreme being, a superior being, bending down and stooping and blessing, blessing an inferior being. The inferior being, guess who that is? That's you and me. Sometimes I think of Jesus Christ as he's walking into the city of Jerusalem or he's walking along a, a dusty path and there's those that are less fortunate than himself laying in here or there and saying, alms for the poor, alms for the poor. And he goes around healing them, doesn't he? What does he have to do to heal them? He, he might have to stoop down. Remember the man that had to cut his way through the roof and had to be lowered down? What did Jesus have to do? He had to stoop down and touch him. Jairus' daughter who was dead there in his house, he had to stoop down to touch and to heal. 
Most of Jesus' ministry dealt with stooping down and healing and touching and meeting people at the point of their need. And that's what God is saying here in this passage. I'm going to be gracious to you, Shanan, to bend or stoop in kindness. Sometimes I think of that as a father, a father to my children. A lot of times as parents, what do we got to do? We got to bend down and stoop down to help them out with something. Stooping down over their homework. Our little ones, we have to stoop down to pick them up, put them in our arms, don't we? Because Jesus cried out, Abba, Father. Abba, Father. I was on the jet home from Israel uh, a week and a half ago, and these little, beautiful little Israeli kids, these little Hebrew kids right next to me, two little girls, probably about two or three years old, and they're flying with their dad. I don't know if, where the mom was at. If she wasn't there. They had three seats. Dad, in the middle of the night, I mean, it's like three o'clock in the morning, he gets up and walks up the aisle. And the kids notice. And what was the cry that rose up from the, that seat while they were watching movies? Abba, Abba. It started small, Abba. And then Abba. And then right where everybody on the plane could hear it, Abba. <laughs> and dad's coming down the aisle trying to make sure that the little kids are okay. The little ones did not like dad being gone on a 10-hour flight for even 10 seconds. And we're going to keep crying out to, to Abba until he comes back, until he returns. Do we have Abba Father like that in our life? Where if we feel like God is gone for just even 10 seconds, we start saying, Father, Father, Father. You know, we start freaking out a little bit and getting upset, don't we? Because we've noticed that the Father has been gone. Now, the Bible tells us that God is a loving Father who will never leave you nor forsake you. We see this passage here. that This is a Heavenly Father that wants to be gracious to you, making sure your needs are okay, that your needs are met, watching over you like a father, like a father bending down to a child. The rabbis believe that this particular section says that God gives his light, his understanding, and grants you favor in the eyes of others. When it says about being gracious to you, he grants you his favor in the eyes of your fellow man, in the eyes of others. Sometimes we walk with that favor and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we have a great week in the, in the eyes and the favor of others and sometimes we don't. But that's what this prayer of blessing is about. That God, that I may have not only your gracious spirit in my life, but I may have your favor that will bless me to have favor with my fellow man. The third blessing of this passage, that he would turn his face to you, turn his face to you. And the rabbis made a very simple explanation for this, that when God turns his face towards us, that means that he's not angry with us. If God is turning his face towards us, that means he's not turning his back on us. So we're crying out, God, that we may have your blessing in my life, Lord, so that that you're back. I'm not looking at your back. I'm looking at your face. When we're looking at the back of mom or dad, we know we don't have their attention. But when we're looking at the face of mom or dad, we know we got their attention. They're looking at us. They, you know, they may be glazed over a little bit because we're constantly talking and, you know, begging for stuff, but we have their attention. Maybe not their undivided attention, but we have their attention. But with Father God... We have his full and undivided attention all the time. And the rabbis are saying, God, that your face would be upon us. God, because when we see your face, we know you're not angry with us. Because a lot of times when mom or dad are angry with us, what is it that they do? They turn their backs to us and they have to walk out of the room lest they blow up on us or something. They have to go cool off. We know mom and dad's angry. They just stomped out of the room because of something we broke. The Jewish people believed this passage again, the Lord turned his face towards you, was a powerful, powerful blessing. When God turns his face towards us, it means he's not angry with us. And they believe that as a result, we can lift up our own heads despite our unworthiness. Even though we are not equals with the Heavenly Father, when we see God's face, in order to see God's face, it means we have to lift up our eyes as well. 
Because if our head's constantly looking at the carpet, if it's constantly looking at our toes, that means we're not seeing God's face. And sometimes that's the way we are in our walk with Christ, isn't it? We're so beat down, so downtrodden, so depressed that our feet are constantly looking down, saying, woe is me, woe is me, I'm no good, I'm not worthy. But yet God's face is upon us. We just don't feel the radiant warmth of his face upon us because we're not looking for it, because we're more comfortable in our sorrows. We're more comfortable being woe is me. Misery loves company. And so that's why the Bible tells us that God the Father is the lifter of our head. Sometimes if you've got a hurt child, a hurting son or daughter, a hurting grandson, a hurting granddaughter, sometimes what do you have to do? You have to grab them gently by the chin and prop their head up, don't you? So they can see in your eyes. They can see in your eyes that you love them, that you care for them, that their world is not ending like they think it is. God the Father is the lifter of your head, friend. Some of you, you have the face of God. You just haven't lifted your head up to enjoy His Spirit and His presence. You have, the, you have the favor of the Father. He's looking upon you. Again, He's bending down, stooping down to you. And He's just saying, my son, my daughter, lift up, lift up and look me in the eyes. Look up and see me. The second part of the third blessing says, and give you peace. Give you peace. And the rabbis say that one might have the prosperity, the good health, all the food and drink, but if there's no peace, then it is all meaningless. Is it no wonder that a lot of our Hollywood stars, they've got everything, yet they have nothing. They have everything, and yet they have nothing because they have no peace. And yet we choose to set them up as great people in our lives. And they have no peace. And some of them commit suicide or they're self-destructive, having to go to rehab every six months. Friends, those are not idols. Those are not heroes. That is great sadness. That is a, that is a sign of a, of a broken soul in need of the, the great mender. And give you peace. Therefore, at the conclusion of this blessing, God seals the deal. He seals the blessing with peace. Because if you've got wealth and prosperity and health, if you've got all the food and drink, you're not hungry. But if you have no peace, if you can't lay your, your head on your pillow at night and sleep in peace, then it's still not worth much. I don't care how many zeros you've got in your bank account, it's still zeros. It's still numbers. But if you've got the peace of Almighty God, there is no greater blessing that God can give you, friend, than His peace. A peace that passes all understanding, and it is also one of the armor of God that God gives us in the book of Ephesians. Feet shod with the preparation of peace. Peace. The armor of God and those, those feet shod after the Roman soldiers were hobnailed boots that were designed to dig into the soil like cleats because peace was not allowed to give up ground. And when you are an individual that is, that is firmly rooted in your peace, you can't backslide. You can't slide backwards. Those hobnailed boots of the Roman soldiers were designed for only one purpose, and that's to go forward. When you are a, a child of God that is in the peace of God, that has, been, has that understanding of blessing and have enjoyed that blessing of God, you can't help but go forward. And you leave the indelible impression of every foot fall that you place down because those hobnailed boots dig into the soil and they have a footprint, just like your, like your shoes, like any set of cleats for football. They have that impression. You leave an impression upon people when you walk in your peace. When you're walking in peace, even though your life may be falling down around your head, you can still go to the office and walking in your peace. And people don't understand how you can still be okay, not breaking down all over the place. 
when you're walking in peace. You may have cancers. You may have job failures. You may have different things. Your kids are in jail. You may have different things that are going on in your life. But if you're walking in your peace, then you're continuing to leave an impression of going forward with your life and in your spiritual walk, your spiritual journey. So God gives all these blessings and he seals the deal with his peace. Armored up with peace. Peace, friends, is not simply the absence of war. It is a harmony between conflicting forces. There's a lot of things in your life that's going to be pulling you to and fro, a lot of conflicting forces. But if you've got peace, it brings harmony, friend, where you can walk and be satisfied. Things may be going down around you, but you can still enjoy and understand that harmony. The third and final point today In that last verse that we read today in verse 27, 27 says this, so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. This is not a part of the blessing that the Lord told them, give to to Moses and Aaron. But this verse is powerful in understanding the name. The name of God that is placed upon his people. To have the name of God inscribed or placed upon someone or something made it holy. And when you accepted Jesus Christ into your life, you had the name of Jesus inscribed upon your heart. Therefore, you are holy. Even though you don't feel like it, though you feel unworthy, you are still holy. You are set aside and you are consecrated before God because you have Jesus Christ inscribed upon your heart, the name of God, You are holy in his sight. Some of the things that were inscribed with the name of God throughout the scriptures is the Ark of the Covenant had the name, capital N. Ark of the Covenant is where God set his name. may not have been inscribed, but if God stated his name resided there upon it, then it became holy. The temples, the various temples that God was worshiped in, He said, I placed my name there. His name made the temples holy. The city of Jerusalem, he said that the city of Jerusalem is the place where I have placed my name. Is it any wonder that Jerusalem is one of the most distraught cities on the planet? It says city of peace. That's what Jerusalem means, city of peace. Jerusalem, Shalom. Jerusalem city of peace. Yet it is one of the most conflicted cities today. In fact, just this last week, a Palestinian took a car and ran his car into seven young Israeli women. They were IDF soldiers. We were there at the Temple Mount looking down into a freshman class of IDF soldiers, 18-year-olds. Half of them had assault rifles. Half of them had not yet been issued theirs. Freshmen, just straight off the bus. These young teenage girls In Israel, it's required for every single person to serve in the military. Young men are required to serve three years. Young ladies are required to serve two years. So these young ladies, every single young lady, every single woman that came up through of age in Israel knows how to handle an AR-15. That's awesome. (laughs) But this the city of of Jerusalem, it's, it's right with conflict. There's such angst and hatred and constant jockeying for position there in the old city. But Jerusalem has the name of God upon it. Again, we know that Jesus Christ is the name. We know Jesus Christ is the name above every other name. The new Jerusalem, the Bible tells us, will have the name upon it. And we have the new name inscribed upon the redeemed. The book of Revelation tells us that it'll be a new name of God. And we too shall have a new name in eternity. We will have the new name inscribed, the Bible says, upon our foreheads. Therefore, if the name of God is inscribed upon our hearts now and be ascribed upon us in eternity, then we are a holy people. When the name is placed upon someone or something, then it enters into blessing because the name implies the favor of God. Friends, if you got Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are holy. 
Yeah, maybe you fell down last week and scraped yourself up and you sinned and you fell, but there is redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Through the blood atonement, the blood atonement is strong enough, friends, to wipe that out under forgiveness and repentance. You are still holy before God. Just because the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines did not make it less holy. The Ark of the Covenant went over to the Philistine camp and it, that, that Ark of the Covenant ended up causing a lot of problems for the Philistines and the Philistines returned it. They didn't want nothing to do with it because their people had all gotten ill and sick because they had fallen under, not blessing, but they had fallen under curse. They set the Ark of the Covenant in front of their God and their temple of Dagon and what happened the next morning they woke up and the, the, the idol Dagon, the fish god, fell down before the Ark of the Covenant and busted its head off and its hands off. Both the head and the power of the hands, saying that Dagon is powerless to stand before God and every tongue will confess and every knee shall bow, even if it's a stone idol. So they set the temple, they set the Ark of the Covenant in front of the God Dagon. They woke up the next day, it's busted up. They hold on to it for a few more days and all the Philistines get sick, have tumors. They're overran with an infestation of rats. I'm gonna tell you, friends, I'd rather be on God's winning side than to be against him. Amen? Because his name was upon the Ark of the Covenant, and his name is also upon you. Let's stand this morning. Can I have the musician come, please? Friends, God is the giver of blessing. That blessing is sometimes material, sometimes it is spiritual, sometimes it is seen, and sometimes it is unseen. Even though we are blessed, we still must ask God's protection upon ourselves and that which he blesses. Friends, I don't know where you're at today. Some of you have had a great week, others of you have had a bad week. But just because you've had a bad week does not mean that God's blessing is lifted from you Friends, part of this blessing that we've read today is having God's face turned towards you. And some of you maybe think that God's face has not been upon you. Some of you feel like that. But today, if your name, if God has inscribed his name upon you and you are holy, and God's face is upon you, you just need to chin up. You just need to ask for the lifter of your head to do that, to lift your head so that you can see, in fact, that God's face is, is there. God has not abandoned you. Quit looking at your toes and look at the eyes of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Abba, Father. Every head bowed today.